uh, I've been practicing the rudiments, getting myself back in. It's a know. shape. Well, yeah. kind of, yeah, and also, you know, not doing anything. So I've found this YouTube thing, and it's really great. It's just like 30 minutes, click track, and there's this chick playing the drums who's just fucking bang on. And she's like, yeah. so run through all the rudiments, and it's it's a load of stuff I never did before. So how yeah. long is it since, since you actually played at this level of intensity? Well, like that? Oh. Uh, well, I, you know, when I did, like, The Professor and the Madman and the Sinclairs and stuff, that's all. Yeah. Really, that's kind of proper playing but it's um it's so easy in the studio because i can do a take and then go and have a cup of tea you know rather than <laughs> the live thing where you've got to go right that's finished and now i've got to be on top of it for the next one so i'm trying to get back into stamina mode i suppose so. yeah i mean unfortunately this is the damned which is high energy <laughs> and an avalanche of drums this is not this is not an easy gig is it well um I listened through to the album yesterday with those ears on. You know how you listen to things differently? Yeah. And you've got to look at it. And then when you're actually listening to it, you know, it's... And um, there's a couple of moments where I thought, ooh, I'm going to have to work <laughs> on that. <a> bit. <laughs> but generally, I, I think, you know, I think it's pretty good, you know. I'd say I'm easy 60% of the way there, so I'm... You know, I'm going to go out and start jogging next. Well, actually, no, that's a lie. I won't. But I'm going to have to do something that's a bit more physical than sitting down and drinking coffee. <laughs> yeah, walk, walking. Start off with, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have. I've been doing that, but it's weird because everywhere that's nice is so crowded now. It's like I went up to Richmond Park to Rome, and it's like there's just people and cars everywhere, and people on bicycles, and you're. Like fuck it, you know it's easier. To walk, you know it's easier to walk around Brentford that you make less contact. <laughs> I know it's the first time I've ever seen people in parks this year in this country, mm. and they're just so busy. It's like anything that's a bit of open green is just kind of full of worrying about. If you... <laughs> How did hell freeze over and the damned actually reform with a classic lineup? Well, I was sort of thinking about this and. First thing that we needed was something that knocked down the barriers. And it was the money, you know, without kind of putting too fine a point on it. It was, it is more money than you can say no to. Will you do it? And I guess, you know, everybody went, yeah, okay, it's five shows. I can live with that to earn that much money for five shows. And then it, it's started to become something slightly different now. It's started to become a little bit kind of, I'm a little bit retrospective about, well, what made this work in the first place? You know, I didn't put all that time in with those guys because I didn't like them, you know, it was kind mm -hmm. of, so you suddenly, I'm finding myself sort of renewing things a bit with like, yeah, I remember Dave and, you know, his mm -hmm. sense of humour and, the way Captain sort of thinks out of the box. And there's a, there's a kind of, you just sort of, there's a, obviously a certain amount of forgiveness goes into it. And you just say, well, I'm actually going to put that away. And then you start to remember the, the kind of personal things that made you click in the first place. And then the other reasoning of, you know, on a more sort of less personal level, you've got the thing of there's not that many people saw that lineup of the band play together. It wasn't around for very long. And they've heard those, you know, all the damn fans have heard those tunes before, but very few of them have actually heard it with that lineup playing them. And, and uh, I think it's, it, you know, that is kind of a pretty good reason. But I think the other thing that comes in is we've all kind of realised that we need to get back in shape in a way in attitude and and performance i think that was the other thing when i listened through to the record yesterday was i realized that most of what was going on on it was actually just that that energy that will yeah. uh, never give in you know it was kind of wow i've got this <laughs> yeah. with both fucking hands and i don't care what anyone this is gonna go and i think you know you, there's a sort of certain reckless element that you need to reintroduce to yourself. 
it's, it's, it's a lot it's a lot of pressure in it because those albums especially the first album and I actually do love the second album but for a lot of people that first album is so much part of their lives you you can't afford to get it slightly wrong or or, or you know or you know when you go and see bands that reform and it's 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 good but it sort of lacks something and do you yeah. feel that pressure to to find that something very much that was always one of my reasons for not doing a reunion was that you know we were like late teens early 20s when we made that album with a totally different set of ideas and attitudes to the world and about what we what we did and i think that you know the people that the Dan fans out there have been listening to that record that way for all of these years. And to kind of deliver anything less is going to be a tough call. Mm -hmm. But I don't really have that many reservations. I think when we go into rehearsals, I think we're going to kind of um, get used to the idea again. <laughs> yeah. Know. Is, it, is it kind of like a muscle memory? It's kind of there anyway. It, with the actual arrangements and parts of the songs, yeah, I mean, they are. It's That really doesn't bother me. But I, you know, I don't want to walk on that stage unless I'm, unless I feel like a god and I'm going to absolutely kill it, you know, go anywhere near it, unless I, and I really do want people to leave going, wow, I didn't expect, you know, mm. and I, 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 I think, you know, the worst criticism I can look at is people who say, well, it wasn't the same, but it was, Great. Um, you know, like I went to see um, the, the Stooges with James Williamson playing and stuff, and they did that, and it really caught that. No, it wasn't the same that they used to do, but boy, it was really, it was a great show, and kind of, and I'm, I'm really hoping that's what we'll be able to do. You know, I think to be fair, that's what people would really want. I don't think, I don't think anybody who's realistic would want to see a band. Who, who was 60 pretending to be 20, but they want to they want to see a kick-ass gig delivered in, in that context of what it is now, wouldn't they? Yes, yeah. exactly. There's no, you know, they're a very forgiving audience, and I'm sure they're all going to be very sympathetic to the beer guts and the, <laughs> the, the band, but that's not what the you know, you buy a ticket and you enter a contract. It's an agreement between the audience and the band. And what that contract is, is we are going to do everything that gives you a great time it's you know anything less is is wrong i suppose so you said you you sort of listening to it now thinking about the chemistry i mean how how do you define the chemistry of that original lineup we all thought we were the best one in the band <laughs> and we all thought we'd have a, we could have a great solo career with the, the other three <laughs> and um that's kind of where it is you know there was always a sense of superiority amongst us <laughs> and that but that you know that was part of the whole thing about the way me and brian worked together was he'd play something that was great and i'd keep up with him and you know and i'd try and play something and we'll follow that then you know and i think that was what gave it the kind of energy you know that spark that was it's important you've got to have that, I think. Otherwise, you are just going to go through the motions. And I've been through the motions and it sucks. I mean, you very much played lead drums on those first two albums. Did you say lead drums? Lead drums, yeah. There was, they're, they're, not, they're not keeping the beats. They're, they're, <coughs> they're doing that, but everything else on top. They're just going off and flurries of toms. That the the, the, the the crazy symbols, which just sound they sound like adrenaline, not symbols. Yeah, it, I think it's um, you know that was the relationship Brian and I had was I I played with what he did. He was my first point of contact, and he was the man, you know. And it was like, okay, well, <laughs> I can do that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna work with this guy, you know. It's kind of what's the bass doing? I don't know. <laughs> but he's, he's in there somewhere but you know and and i think also a big part of that it, it was quite funny I, I got the um the original tapes to new rows and transferred them over to digital you know and um breaking it down into its original eight track state it's like the guitar sound doesn't really have any distortion on it it's a really mm. kind of clean sound and i always thought it was this kind of white noise and then i've <laughs> 
it was the symbols that were doing, making, you know, the white noise. Kind mm. of testament pathway and that sound they got in there. But I never really got it until I'd actually broken it down and listened to it. And that was kind of, I guess, yeah, part of the sound. I mean, I've been in, I was, at Path, I was in Pathway a few years ago before they knocked you down. I cannot believe that you made a record sound that big and that exciting in what was basically a cupboard. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a cupboard. It was, um, you know, I, I, I didn't enjoy it. You know, that wasn't my vision of, of a recording studio. You know, it was the first time I'd ever been in a studio. That wasn't what I was expecting. I was expecting Abbey Road and... Yeah, yeah. Instead of this, it was kind of squeezing behind the microphone stands and not moving them because you know you had to get back behind the kit because you'd done it. It was, yeah, <coughs> but there was something about the sound in there that the engineer Bazza, I think he was pretty handy with the soldering iron, and I think he'd souped up some of the components on the desk and stuff. I wonder what happened to the desk. Yeah, where... it's got to be, be around. Somebody, somebody will have it, won't they? Be in the yeah. back of a lockup somewhere. I know he's he's still working and doing things. A very interesting conversation because he did Sultan's a Swing as well. He recorded that and all the Costello stuff. And it was uh, well, you know, what do you think the trick is, then, Baza? And it was <laughs> he said you can put four blokes with guitars in any room and they'll play the song, and you can play that same song three or four times and once it will be brilliant and the other time you know he said it's just something that's unquantifiable they'll say play the same notes same sequence same speed you know nothing really changes but something massively changes about the way the band work together and play together the, the subconscious in it the, the moments where it connects at a very very deep level and yeah i know it's i know we're ostensibly talk about punk rock here but it's because it's the purest form of rock and roll it does connect on a very deep level in those amazing so. moments. Much more so because with punk rock, it was you and some mates getting together and there wasn't any kind of ego. Every band I'd worked with before, they all kind of had wanted to have this prowess as, as great guitarists or great bass players. They all looked up to the, you know, the, I don't know, the, the, you know, the Jeff Becks and that kind of techno thing and, and punk rock, completely removed ego from the rehearsal room because it then went away from people that had practiced for a long time to people that had never practiced before but because of that they didn't have to prove anything to anyone else in the room so they would always give it their best shot if you like and it, I always think it was the part of the thing that's really important about that is that when you're new and you're kind of still enjoying you know being in a band and you don't have that ego or well, the ego is removed from it you tend to listen to what's going on around you and i think that's the real key to making uh you know for a band to kind of get that chemistry working is when you forget about what you're doing and mm. you start to take in what what the events are around you and then how that changes what you do and it's it's a very difficult thing to do because for years I only ever played for other drummers in the audience. It was, you know, it was like I do a film, I go, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, like over there from nine nine nines watching, you know. So <laughs> you know, and and um, but as soon as I started to remove that, I found I, I I enjoyed playing much more, and actually it got much easier, and the end result mm. was better, you know. So I think there's a lot to be said for not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's interesting to talk about Pathway and it's not the sort of studio expected because the second album, it was kind of everything was upgraded, but you didn't enjoy that experience either, did you? Well, I, I didn't have any, it wasn't the recording experience that was bad. That, that was all pretty good. What was really was that it was, you know, as far as I was concerned, I was about to quit the band. I was, I'd already decided to leave and I only really made you know i only made the album not to let everyone else down if you like you know that was the conversation i had about it and that was you know that was uh the, the hardest part about that was knowing that the whole thing was kind of coming to an end for me and it was breaking down and you know i wasn't particularly convinced by the songs on the album because you know brian had written the first album and then suddenly he hadn't written the second one you know and so we would you know, Brian said, well, you guys should write some songs. And it was like, we'd never written a song ever. 
you know, and it was a whole kind of, you know, wow, what are we going to do? And I was like, oh, man, you know, I'm not sure this is going to work at all, you know. So those those were kind of, that was much more the downside of that record. I mean, the other elements of it were great. You know, everyone in the band was great, you know, um, getting Lowell Coxall to work and come mm. down. He was brilliantly entertaining. He was, you know, great. He was, you know, kind of... Um, an acceptance as well from the old guard because he came from this sort of real avant-garde, brilliant musicianship kind of background. And then um, there he was with a load of punk rockers sort of embracing it, which was quite, you know, for me, that was like, wow, if Lowell Coxall says you're cool and you're cool enough for him to come and play with you, then actually that means that Steve Hillage, Fred Frith, The Soft Machine, all those other guys are going to go, well, okay, this is obviously, you know, but... I, and well, they did, really, yeah. Sorry, Steve Hillage did embrace punk as well, didn't he? Yeah, well, he, he was more on rave, I think. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I still love that Motivation Radio album of his. It's mm, uh, great. Yeah. We were in in the olden days. We were touring, and we all woke up one kind of sunny morning with these absolutely diabolical hangovers. And I put Motivation Radio on. I mean, you know, the damn listening to Steve Hillage was just kind of so removed from any <laughs> reality. So, and I put that album on, and it was seriously one of the best things I ever did because everybody was just like so, you know, charmed by it. I suppose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Record. And when you're when you got one on, you know, it kind of it was absolutely a perfect thing. But yeah, the what I found was the, the kind of the the really. The, the good musicians and the talented ones weren't at all intimidated by punk. They kind of knew what was coming. They knew what it was about. They'd already done it, you know, something like Viv Stanch or, mm. you know, but a, a lot of this kind of nearly made it. So the ones that weren't, they, they were particularly aggressive and not very, you know, friendly. Because I suppose they saw us as a threat and it was, you know, we fell into that. That's not proper music category <laughs> i think a lot a lot of people would appreciate the musicianship because the damned it, it could play it wasn't it's not a thrash record at all is it it's every single player is at the top of their game in those two records it was just such a different sound i think mean, you know because brian was you know he only ever mm. played I would say 11, but it's such a cliche these days. <laughs> I mean, Brian's amp settings, he just ran his hand along the top of all the controls until everything was just up as far as it'd go. <laughs> and then sort of a pun, Luton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And of course, I guess the way I played and just the, the way we looked with short hair, you know, we weren't like the local blues band coming in for a night with, you know, it was, woo it was quite challenging to all those status quo fans and those kind of people that were in their faded denims. Mm. <laughs> I mean, to, to, I mean, to talk about the second album again, because I mean, I actually think it's one of the most underrated albums of all that, of all that period. And have, have you gone back to re-listen to it at all? And do you have different, oh. different view on it now? now? Now you're out of the pressure of the band falling apart while making it. Um, I need to, I listened to it a few weeks ago and I was really quite surprised by some of the playing on it. It's really great. I mean, it's, mm. and I think that the only thing that, I, you know, if you're going to criticise it, there's a sort of commercial sense that there wasn't a new rose. There wasn't anything that sounded really like the first album. It was a very different kind of record. And I think it was the wrong time for that album. But then again, I, I I always have trouble saying, well, that that should have been the single on that record because I can't really hear one anywhere on it, you know. It's that. Oh, I would say I think Problem Child is is a really great uh, song. I'm, I'm actually quite excited to see you perform that live. <laughs> yeah, well, I better learn it. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the easier ones, surely. <laughs> well, I'm. The, there's, there's the dilemma of the reunion, you know, the first album's 28 minutes long or something. <laughs> yeah, so you, your hand is forced to play the second album as well. So we're going to have to be doing, you know, B-sides in the second album, which brings it on to the, you know, how do you put that together? So it, 
as the right kind of dynamic. But I, I think I think that's a good thing. I, I, to me, the maybe the dark horse of all this is that for album will finally get the recognition it deserves. Mm. It's funny, you know, it, it's sort of almost like people come out of the woodwork and admit liking it. It's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, because I, I, I do get some very positive comments about it and people are, are into it. And I think maybe that's probably because now it's a much more acceptable damned record than mm. it was in 1977. You know, I think it's... People got used to the fact that they sort of changed into different kinds of songs and different moods and blah, blah, you know, that kind of thing. So I think now when you play music for pleasure, it, it, that kind of slots in much better with that. It's like a different damned record. It's, it's kind fact, of odd, yeah. It's, it's, it's odd, just, odd to, yeah. You know. It's odd to say in a conversation about the damned, but music for pleasure is actually, it was, was probably too sophisticated at the time. <laughs> It may well have been. I'm, I, I know. I, I sort of, um, I worked pretty hard on that because Brian sort of changed his style as well a bit. You know, something like politics or, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of chops going in there. You know, and it's, <laughs> you know, it's kind of. So to sort of stay on top of that, I had to, you know, I had to work pretty hard on, mm. on that record. I think, you know, but. When I listen to it now, it's kind of, I can't actually believe that's what, I, you know, how much <laughs> was going on. It was almost like a King Crimson record. Of, yeah, I, uh, I think that there's, I mean, that's the thing about a lot of those earlier punk records. They're like prog compressed into faster songs, so even harder to play than prog. I mean, when you listen to the rhythms on Music for Pleasure, you're, you're playing sort of bossa novas and prog, prog styles and some songs. Yeah, well, I mean, here's the other thing is you, you know, you, you do start to learn. You get, you join the band, you go on the road, you do the thing, you know, and actually you're playing every day and you just get better at it, you know. And you, I guess that was sort of, maybe that was part of the reason why I managed to pull it off. But, <laughs> I, I, you know, it was, I, I've, I've only ever played on instinct, really. It's, you know, mm. it's kind of what I sort of imagine, which is, not always what it sounds like you know you kind of think oh i'll do that and it'll sound like this but when you hear it back actually it doesn't <laughs> it, you know it sounds like something Ooh, i'll put that one away until later then you know, it's, kind of... <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's the best way of playing though playing on feel isn't it yeah i think so and that in, in a way that's another thing with the reunion is having the kind of um i don't know just go back to playing the way I did on that first album, which is, on a technical thing is, is nearly all single stroke roles and, you know, getting the accents right. Whereas now I tend to be a bit more kind of lazy about some of the things I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But at the same time, knowing, you know, that you can sort of go, to, you know, when you want to. And it's and so the big <laughs> temptation really is to go in the middle of <laughs> New Rose or Feel the Pain just because you can. And so I've got to kind of, again, it's all about the same mindset of sort of putting yourself back to how that was. It's interesting you mentioned Feel the Pain because that was a very early indication that the Damned were not doing this by numbers. <clears throat> I mean, I, I would almost argue that that was quite possibly the first proto kind of goth song in a way. The dark atmospherics of it and yeah. the, the, the ghoulish vocal. It's <laughs> it kind of, well, it... it it never sounded out of place, you know, when Brian turned up with that. It was kind of a, in a way, it was almost sort of quite an old fashioned way of thinking about a record of the dynamic of an album that starts fast and you take it down a bit so people can catch up. Then you have a big dynamic ending for side one and then people will turn over and you can, you know, it's, it's and, and so it, in some ways it was quite old fashioned, I think, having a sort of slow one in there because you get to have. You know, the amount of times that the band is like, well, you've got to have a slow run in there, you know, no open yeah. doors, you know, and sort of think, yeah, all right. But it would sort of followed that dynamic, but it was also very, very in keeping with that, like you say, that sort of, again, that Brian's sort of dark side of writing, mm -hmm. of, you know, this kind of, uh, I don't know, it's not really suicidal, but it could be. Yes, yeah, it's, it's quite macabre, isn't it? It's, uh, mm. And Dave, as well. 
Yeah, yeah, that, perfect for it. Yeah, so, yeah, it had his name on most of the beginning. But it's always it always is a filmic side to the damned. Obviously, the, the band's name comes from a film. Dave's yeah. a big film buff. It's so it's, it's not it's not monoc- the songs aren't monochromatic. They make little pictures, don't they? That was I think that was something that we were always into. I mean, you know, that was one of the common grounds was Dave and Brian's sort of real love of movies. I, I would say horror movie, but it wasn't. It was, you know, Visconti and it was, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of cultured stuff. And I think that was one of the reasons why they always kind of fell in together because Brian was already there, but he wasn't as committed as Dave was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Dave 24 7. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, I, you know, that was the thing about Dave. He, He's always been like that. Even if he's digging the garden, he looks like Dave Vanian. You know, he's, he, doesn't, <laughs> yeah. he doesn't put on a tracky. You know, when he gets in. yeah, or, or it'd be a black one if he did have to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I can honestly say I've never really seen him when he wasn't being Dave, and and it was always a bit strange at first because it was kind of this obvious and um, what seemed like a very synthetic personality to. You know, when you first meet him and you first see him, you think, well, this guy can't be real, you know, he, <laughs> looking like that. I'll bet he doesn't get the bus home like that. But actually he did, you know, and it yeah. was. And then, when you know, as soon as I realised actually that that was, that was him and there wasn't any pretense about him, it wasn't anything other than, no, this is me, this is the way I choose to look, this is the way I choose to live. Then, you know, it was, you, you know, you just have to go, well, there's a, a bigger commitment with Dave Vanian than probably anyone else I'd ever met, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's brought in to sing because of what he looked like. When he, the, the original choice is going to be, um, you'd actually already asked Sid Vicious, hadn't you? But he didn't turn up for the audition. Well, it, it wasn't that so much as I'd already met Dave through Malcolm McLaren. And... Um, we hadn't met Sid before, but we were at the Nashville at a Pistols gig, and Brian and I were there talking when we knew to get sooner. And then um, Dave walked in, and Brian went, "Ah, oh, he looks good." And Brian always used to mug me into going up and asking strangers if they could sing or not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and but this time, of course, it was like, "Oh well, I know that guy." That's Dave. He said, "Oh, we'll get him down," you know, because he looks great. And they Dave came over and she had a bit of a chat. And then about half an hour later, I suppose Sid Vicious walked in wearing this Lame Teddy Boy jacket <laughs> and looked fucking awesome. I mean, he looked—he was dressed. You know, he was dressed for going out. And Brian went, oh, he looks really good, you know. So I went over and started talking to Sid, you know, and, and got his number and stuff. And I'm not sure why he didn't come to the re- the, the the audition, I suppose. Whether there's, Someone said that there was supposed to be a phone call, but I never got it or I never made it. And then, but anyway, we were Sidless and Dave turned up and just kind of... Um, really went for it, you know, it was... Did you have any idea that Dave could sing or was he just, because he looked good? Um, it didn't really matter if he could sing or not. That wasn't yeah. the point. The point was to be, you know, I suppose, you know, just... Uh, you can teach someone to sing, but you can't teach mm. them to have a personality. Yeah, that's true. Know, they can pretend to have one. So it must have been a moment. You must, have, you and Brian must have looked at each other and gone, "Fuck!" When he started singing, because he's got a hell of a voice, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. And I, I can't remember what we had for a PA in those days because we were practicing in an old church hall in, in um, this Grove by the Dunn office, and um, I think we only had like a, a, a guitar amp and a speaker for the sync the vocals to go through or something. You know, we didn't have much. So I don't know if anyone heard him, but he kind of put so much into it, you know, and moving around and just kind of, he, he really took to it, I suppose. I was amazed when I found out years later, it was the first time he'd ever sung. Yeah, I know, it's, it's incredible, isn't it? What, yeah. what, what, did you, what did you start with? Did you just do a cover or was it just like a jam and you just... 
Um, I can't remember. I remember um, Brian going through new rows with him, though. And Brian just had the sort of lyrics written on a bit of paper, you know, and, and just throwing him the target. And it sort of goes like this. You got it? And it was like that. Was all the was like, you know, first few lines. And he said, you know, make it your own. <laughs> and he did. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> It's interesting that uh, that Nashville gig with the Pistols because I was interviewing the uh, the original Banshees drummer about two weeks ago. I've, I've finally tracked him down after about thirty years, and that was the first punk gig he'd been. And he talked about Sid walking in the room, going, "He just looked absolutely amazing." And he got to know him that night as well. And it's he obviously made quite an impression. That is, it made more of an impression than the band did. <laughs> well, I mean, we'd all seen the Pistols before, anyway. You know, it was kind of, they were. I used to work in Nashville, I think it was like every Tuesday or something. And I think it was, they, they'd do three weeks support and then one week headlining. And um, I saw him opening for Roger Ruskin's Spear in his giant kinetic wardrobe. <laughs> and they were supporting him. So, and, and I've never ever seen a photograph of it. I'm sure there must be some somewhere of Rotten surrounded by these robots and this whole kind of odd <laughs> looking stage set that was Roger Spears. But we used to go and see him every week, you know, it wasn't like, I know people that didn't get the chance, but they were just down the road, you know, it was mm. a short bus ride away. And it was not so much the band that was playing, but the people that would be there, you know, because it was the only time that you really got to sort of hang out with like-minded, you know, I suppose, you know, punks, because there weren't many around, but certain gigs, everyone would go out for, so you kind of do it. Yeah. So the first time you met Brian was with the London SS, wasn't it, in the, um, on Parade Street, yeah. in the, uh, in the, underneath what's now the Chinese restaurant in the cellar. It was a chip shop then. Was it a chip shop then, yeah. It was a chippy then. <laughs> oh yeah, because they used to interview people in the chip shop, didn't they, upstairs or something. You could get a cup of tea. I didn't know, it wasn't like that Tony and uh, Mick were just watching a war movie and, and Brian was starting to play along with it and then you just play along with Brian and that's the moment you just knew. Well, yeah, it was, you know, Mick and Tony weren't very punk rock then, they were more Mott the Hoople, you know, they had yeah. very kind of long hair, leather trousers and shirts and things and they, you know, they said, yeah, it's rock and roll, man, you know, and this sort of unconvincing stuff. But Brian was totally different he you know he had short hair and drain pipe jeans and winkle pickers and wore his guitar at the right height you know it was yeah. all those kind of things that make such a big difference and they were really bored with auditioning people and they had a black and white tv that they were watching while we were playing and i think they didn't really have many songs of their own there was like one or two that had crept in but i think we were doing you can't always get what you want and when it came to the guitar solo, I was sort of sitting there going, these guys are cunts, I'm fucking down here playing and they're watching TV. And it was like, and then it sort of dawned on me, well, maybe I'm just not working hard enough here. Maybe I'm just not. And it just so happened that on the, on the TV was this war movie with this dog fight with these spitfires and stuff, you know. And, and Brian started playing along with, what was going on on the screen so it was like da, 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 you know and, he, and i thought well i like that that's pretty good well maybe i'll show him what i can do <laughs> so i kind of kick things up a bit you know how astronomers can sometimes yeah yeah and so, is that the would you say that's the moment the damned kind of formed that that's the uh it was certainly the moment me and brian clicked i think mm. And, uh, but they, you know, Mick and Tony were just so uncommittal about me being in the band, you know, because I had the wrong haircut and the wrong trousers. So it was, you know, and I lived out in the sticks. So it wasn't like, you know, they went, wow, we got to get you in. It was kind of, well, we're not really sure. Will, will you come down again? You know, and uh, I, I went down and played with them like, I don't know, four or five times or something. I don't, and, you know, and then it, 
uh, just Brian just just said, you know, well, you know, me and you should go and do it because they won't say yes to you, and I think you're the guy. So, why don't you and I put something together? So all you all you got out of that room was was a uh, was your nickname. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that. But actually, you know, the old lucky ball and chain isn't so bad. It's um, oh, it's a great name. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there, there are several reasons why I stuck with it. One was that. Uh, the doll wouldn't know who you were. Yeah. <laughs> and I really didn't expect the dam to last for more than, you know, six months, maybe. I didn't think it was going to be a thing. And I also realised that if I was Rats Games, then <laughs> once the dam had collapsed, then I'd be able to go back to being Chris Miller and I'd probably end up working on a cruise ship or in a or yeah. some were doing one of those kind of things that everybody had told me that's what drummers do you know you know if you ever said to anybody oh, i want to be in a group they would like yeah you know in your dreams forget it go away you might be able to join the army and you can play the drums in <laughs> if you yeah. Yeah. That sort of thing. so yeah i guess i'm digressing so so, so, so you and Brian, did you did you conceptualise the group? Did Brian have an idea of what a group should be, or or, or was it were you sort of is it 50 50? No, Brian, no, no, it was Brian. He, yeah, he, you know, he he kind of knew what was what. I don't know what it was, and he was slightly older than me, so I he, he was very easy to have as a big brother, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he. He sort of had a lot of the records of things I was into, like the MC5. He had all of their albums, and I'd only ever heard one song, you know, on a compilation because they weren't that accessible, you know. It was, but he had some great stuff and some outtakes. And I remember sitting there watching him, and we watched uh, that movie Borsellino. And Brian was just sort of turning me on to new stuff, but he kind of knew what he, what was the right thing to have, you know, in attitude, and you know, and I suppose I was, I was pretty open to, you know, to life, I suppose, you know, it was, here was the new plan to, you know, I'm going to be in this group, I'm going to do that, it may work, it may not, but for right now, that's, that's where I am, and, you know, it was better than working in Harry Fenton's in, in Red Hill. Yeah, yeah, and most things are, so, yeah. and you, and you remain friends of Brian over the years, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, we still sort of play together, not as much as we used to, but we I mean, we will be. But yeah, we've always stayed in touch, you know. You know, why wouldn't we? Mm. And, and and you brought Captain into it, into the uh, fold, didn't you? Because you were working together. So, and you knew he could play. He's a guitar player, but who's forced to be a bass player. They don't like that, do the guitar players? <laughs> he was... Um, he was a guitar player, but he was already playing bass in a, in a covers band called Oasis, coincidentally. Yeah. Or, well, not coincidentally, because it's not a coincidence <laughs> with anything, but he was playing in a cover, bass in a covers band called Oasis. And he had an amp and a speaker, you know, and a bass. And so that put him ahead of the competition because mm. we didn't really know anybody else that was sort of set up like that. And he, you know, he... Uh, yeah, you know, it just one day after the audition with Dave, me and Brian were just talking and saying, well, we're almost ready to go. We, we need a bass player who is there. And I was like, well, you know, Ray as he was then, you know, he's got the gear, he's around and he's up for doing it. So we'll, we'll mm. let's get him in and we'll see how it goes from there. He's it's actually really good. Really He's a really good bass player. He play he plays bass like a guitar player, a lot of little runs, but very melodic. And it's it's yeah. what is it? It's a very key part of the early damn sound. Is how very powerful good. his bass is. Yeah. And it was because he hated playing the bass, I'm sure. And so he found <laughs> he found loads of great little places where he could do runs and you know because he was a pretty good guitar player. So it was you know he knew his notes and he knew what worked and what didn't. And so. He just kind of slips stuff in there. It's like quite interesting listening back to it. There's sort of things I'm like, I don't remember he used to do that. You know, yeah, that yeah. it's kind of there. But like the beginning to neat, neat, neat. Very few people play it properly with that. It's kind of like a funny little skip thing that Captain put in it. But, it's a great, it's know. a great intro. Yeah. Yeah. 
but the amount of bass players I've had to say, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> yeah, <bad>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you were best mates then, weren't you, that time? You were like, th like thick as thieves? Well, you know, working in Fairfield Halls together and being a bit alternative with our music tastes and stuff. It was quite a natural thing. And he did me a lot of favours because I, I was sort of pretty homeless through a lot of times, you know, so I'd always be able to go and toss down at Captain's and he'd give me beans on toast and stuff like that. You know, it was kind of, bless him. I mean, now in hindsight, I'm sort of, uh, you know, I should have probably been a lot more grateful. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, you know we um, we'd have quite a laugh at Fairfield halls and stuff anyway. Just because mm. you know about the same age, same taste in music, you know, and it was it was easy to do. You know, we were both in the same kind of area in Croydon. You know, so it was yeah. yeah. Is it, with with the getting the lineup back together, is this is this one of the great things you've actually been able to repair? these old relationships or well, maybe you haven't I don't know Do you, have they been repaired I don't know I really don't I think um, uh, it would be nice to wouldn't it I think and I think um, I mean hippy dippy shit though it sounds you know the one thing that everybody always says really if you want to repair is you have to forgive hmm whatever it is you think is wrong, you have to forgive it, you know, and if both parties agree that they can forgive, then actually then you're on the road to rebuilding. And the interesting thing is I was um, thinking about actually about the relationship and it's actually, it's not about what, who you really are. It's about what the other person thinks you are and the things that you've done, you know, and, Actually, the, the real point is to prove that you're not the person that they think you are. Mm. Is that, is that yeah, a bit too yeah. much at this time of day? No, no, that makes that makes sense. <laughs> I mean, you had to phone them up, didn't you, to get um, when when the band was put back together? If I remember reading it somewhere, that you you did all the calls, didn't you? Would no. that be the first? No, was it no, not you? Like, okay. No, we didn't see each other until the photo shoot. Oh, really? The roundhouse. Yeah, it was all, no, no, before then. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, the, the, the photos, yeah, I've seen the photos, yeah, so was that the first time you've seen each other for, for a few years? Yeah, well, <laughs> for quite a while, I mean, the only time I'd seen before then, I was fucking hammered. <laughs> 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 Probably best forgotten. So, so, but, so yeah, what was, I, it, was it one of those things, you just walk in the room and it's just like yesterday, or is it? There was a, uh, you know, maybe you could, 10, 10 seconds with the very first looking into the eyes of and just sort of is he going to hit me? Shall I hit him? <laughs> we're, no, we're not, you know, we're not on that thing and the, the okay, we've, we've agreed to be here, let's, you know, this is the first step, so you know, and um, it, we kind of uh, conversed in a very sort of normal way, really, between us all. Mm. You know, sort of things like what gear are you going to use? You know, what, how do you, you know, just very sort of open and easy. I think we're all smart enough to kind of not want to blow it. Yeah, respect uh, respect the uh, magic that's actually there between yeah. you as, as musicians. Yeah, I mean, that's, to me, I don't think bands when they're older have to be, pretend to be little gangs. That's a teenage thing, and it's, I'm sure yeah. the Rolling Stones don't all go and sit in, in, in Keith Richards' hotel room every night. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's the, you know, individuals are individuals and you don't necessarily always want to do the same things at the same time or be in the same places, you know, it's not. It's, you know, it's not a personal thing. It's just the way we're all made. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Mm. Mm. I mean, but I think that's the thing about being, you know, city living anyway. It's one of the things I like about living in London is that, you know, if you don't like the bloke standing next to you, you can move. <laughs> yeah. gets upset about it. You know, it's not, a, it's not a big deal. It's Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I, I'm sure the damn thing would be a lot, lot easier than that. You know, once... Once you start rehearsing and 
Well, yeah, I think it it will, because like I was saying before about a lot of the things that you forget, a lot of the reasons you like someone, you, you know, you forget. And as soon as you start working together, then those things come back and you begin to remember what it was that mm. was okay about, you know, those people. I mean, is it, has, has the relationship to two people in the band change? I mean, obviously the early lineup, Brian was older, he had the vision, he was the boss. I, I imagine there is no boss now. This is just people just playing no. the songs. No, this is, um, you know, no decisions get made without all four agreeing and mm. everything's being done in a very, these days they call it transparent way. So while it's like that, everybody's happy. And I think if if any of that changes, then we wouldn't be happy. And, I'd, you know, mm. I mean, it's not too late for the whole thing to get fucked up. <laughs> yeah, I know so a lot of people are wondering if it's actually going to get onto the stage. I'm, 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 pretty, I'm pretty confident it will. It's, it's, I mean, it's good you're all getting the payday, but it's also good that, um, the, the, the band are actually going to do something with these great great tunes, you know, a proper lineup playing them. And we are all still alive. Mm. I mean, this is uh, the thing. It's, we can still do this, and we're capable of doing this, and we're able to do this. And it was like I said, you know, there's, I've had a lot of regrets, and I, I don't want this to be one of them. Mm. You know, I don't mm. want to be standing over a grave saying, you know, we should have done that, and feeling that it got lost somewhere down the line. Just because well, of, you know. where, where can you take this? I mean, is it is it just going to be these shows and that's it? Or what what happens if Brian walks in and he's got an absolutely killer riff? I mean, that's going to make it. Is that going to be awkward or just a icing on the cake? No, I don't know. I mean, there's there's been talk about trying to record something, but nobody can agree what they want to record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe no, that could be like like a beautiful extra that could be, couldn't it? But not the deal breaker. Well, uh, well, my. My plan was always that, you know, we should write three songs each. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and especially these days, you know, good luck to whoever gets the most downloads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 50 quid. <laughs> I, you know, I, I've, I've always believed the band was capable of a kind of an, an ultimate album, if you like. A kind of, I mean, I, I was talking to Dave about it, you know, and then, Really, you know, I always felt we could make our dark side of the moon. Mm -hmm. You know, and I know people say you've already made enough records. You know, why bother? <laughs> but there's a feeling that I always have that the dam never reached its full potential. It, it used up, you know, a lot of its tank. But I genuinely think that there's the, the real genius behind the people in that band and the way they think if you can capture that right and get everybody in the right zone on the right thing we could probably make a record that would be you know genuinely outstanding I, and I, i've always had this space in the, the band that it could do that and so there's a part of me that says yeah I'd, I'd really like to do that and try and make that work and try and make that happen but that is you know it's a long way away from a you know, just trying to imagine working in the studio because we all know a lot now. Mm. So it then becomes, well, we'll put the Sennheiser mics on the Tom Toms. Well, I'd rather have the OKG. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it just seems that there's a, um, a lot of feasibility because if you give it up and say, well, you know, it's up to you what the guitar sounds like, it's your guitarist, you know, you, you don't really end up with a, collaborative sound you end up with too much individualism mm -hmm. and one of the great things about when you make your first records and still is that you'd have a grown-up there that they'd call a producer who would make yeah. all of those decisions <laughs> yeah and then he would say do you like the, the bass sound do you like the drum sound and it was kind of out of your hands whereas i know if i go in there i'll get my sound I always get and yeah put that there do this you know and but that isn't someone else's vision of what it should be and that's why you have producers is because it's their vision of what you can be and the potential that you've got and it's their job to draw that out of you especially um, in a band like the damned where there are four quite different people just trying to get them into the same space I think that's what a great producer would do that trying to trying to get that synthesis 
between four very talented, quite different characters. But, you know, that, that does take, it's, it's not impossible, but it takes someone who's very good at making that happen, doesn't it? Yeah, well, um, I don't know, you know, you have to, you have to want to do it. Yeah, yeah. You have to <laughs> And you have to be prepared to, you know, leave your ego at the door. I think after the first gig, when you bring the house down, I think it'll be a lot easier to talk about it that night. <laughs> yeah, I I know the last reunion tour we did, which was back in the nineties or somewhere like that. And, you know, by the end of it, everybody was up for making another record. You know, and it was so I. I kind of, I suppose I've got the inside of view of it that, you know, I know when you put these people together, actually it, it can work really, really great. But yeah. it's also sometimes can be very, very fragile. I yeah. think the pressure, it's more pressure, <coughs> pressure to do it, to do it now because everybody's older. There's, there's, it's not like a 20, well, maybe, you never know, in 20 years you can still do it, but it's, it won't be as easy as it is now. <laughs> well, exactly, you know. They'll be a lot more forgiving. Well, I liked what was the um, what was the tour name? I think Dave came up. What was? Oh, no, never mind. Never mind. I've, I've lost it. It will come back to me. John, on, on a slight tangent, what whatever happened to Day Zero? Um, a friend of mine uh, found him not long ago. Um, I'm not sure what he's doing. So he was, he did he go back to being a hairdresser? He was a hairdresser originally, wasn't he? I think so, yeah. I can't remember, um, but I did get told what he, what he was up to and that we should go out and have a lunch or something one day and just see how he was, because he was quite brilliant. I mean, incredibly witty and funny, I mean, and, you know, quick and shit, you know, it was kind of... It was, you know, that was Malcolm's thing, was to have the exact... Polar opposites with two singers. So you had Dave Vanian, who was muscular and, you know, all in black, and then Dave Zero, who was kind of very blonde and effeminate, slightly chubby, you know, yeah. but with this sort of tongue that could kill. It was, you know, one sentence would reduce a grown man to tears. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting concept. He's, he's kind of one of those weird f punk footnotes because nobody ever knows whatever happened to him. Yeah. I think he likes it like that. Who actually instigated the, um, the damn getting back together this time? I, I thought it was somewhere between the band. Was it was it like a promoter just looking for an interesting project? No, no it was Dave. Vanian decided that it was what he wanted to do next. Mm. Um, you know, he, he, he was saying, you know, he, he didn't feel that Brian had ever really got the recognition that he deserved. And uh, he, you know, wanted to kind of fix that a bit. And, you know, I don't know. Dave wants to do it. I mean, I mean, the last time I saw him, you know, a couple of years ago, he'd said the same thing about getting together and doing some shows. So it's been on his mind for a while, but he's to blame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for all the best, for the best reasons. Because it's true, because Brian doesn't really get, obviously he gets some recognition and obviously he gets some good royalties, but he doesn't get the recognition in in the uh you know the rock guitar legends he doesn't really get that level does he which he should get no, no. it's tragic really because he was um he was ahead of his time with that sort of style and the way he played which then very you know quickly got copied and i think that you know he kind of got left behind with the with that and you know he but he was the only one he kind of had it nailed. It was uh, brilliantly random. Mm. Well, Mick well. Jones, Mick, I remember interviewing Mick Jones and he said that Brian was the pers first person he ever met who knew what punk was going to be. Yeah, yeah. So, and it, it very interesting because it, it, it's actually not really a hippie philosophy, but there's sort of elements of that, which is do whatever you want to do you know, musically, clothes, whatever, if it's your, if that's what, what you want to be, then you go right ahead and be it. And if that's what you want to listen to, then do it. And yeah, at the time that was quite forward thinking because, you know, everything was very um, 
not gang, but it was kind of tribal. You know, it was either disco or heavy rock, or it was prog, or it was, you know, and so to sort of suddenly be playing, you know, Sonny Rollins and, you know, Aaron Garth <laughs> Jazz right next to the Stooges and saying they're the same thing. Mm. You know, it, it was, yeah, you know, it, it was that attitude of do it. But at the same time, the rules came with it. You had to have a haircut and you couldn't wear <laughs> yeah. yeah, no rules, but lots of rules. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> She's always a great danger, you know, you get rid of one kind of society to replace it with a, a new way of thinking and you find that your new way of thinking is actually even harder to be a part of than the one you left. <laughs> <one> you left. <laughs> yeah. and, what, and finally, what do, you, what do you think about, there's been some criticism, not a lot, but in some quarters about the how expensive the tickets are. Yeah, I, I don't think they're that horrendous, to be honest, compared to what you pay to go and see Morrissey or Van Morrison as well. You know, it's like those kind of prices are way higher. I think it's a long way down the line to, before the shows come. So I think there's probably going to be more expense putting the shows on than there would have been a year ago, you know, in the new year when we were first planned. I think it was... Um, so I'm not kind of, you know, I'm not saying, yeah, that's OK. But I think if you want to see us, you, you've got to pay the money and it's not really much dearer than anything else. And it's only going to happen this time. So. I mean, in, in a way, do you think it's uh, people, people st still tend to think in, in punk circles, it, you know, they love the damned, but they think it's, it's just only the damned that should be 10 quid, you know, it's not, instead of, instead of like taking the damned as, as a classic, one of the classic British bands, you know, it's, it's, People, people, people's almost comfortable with the, the idea that you know you just get taken for granted a little bit, even though you hardly ever play with this lineup. Well, yeah, I think it's it's a tough call because first of all, it's I'm not privy to any of this sort of business side of it and how much it costs and what the prices are for that. I mean, I see figures and things, and I kind of look at it and go, oh, "That's quite a lot." But when you think, you know how much work is going to have to go into this. I mean, just our rehearsal time alone is going mm. to I mean, pretty much start in the next couple of months and then carry on throughout until the shows themselves. It's, as far as I can tell, the plan at the moment. So, you know, it costs a lot of money to put the shows on. It costs a lot of money to get me and Captain Sensible back in the same room together. Yeah. And <laughs> everything that goes along with that. And... You know, it's like, really, you're going to quibble about, you know, an extra five mm. or a ticket price. It's like, well, don't go then. But, you know, you ain't ever going to get it again. And it's, and it's a production as well. It's not just the dam playing at Ding Walls in 1976 through a few borrowed amps. It's, it's, it's actually a production show, isn't it? Well, yeah, there is, is going to be. You know, I actually, after we spoke, you reminded me when you said here, yeah, what? <laughs> going to get a look at them and I, I spoke <laughs> to the management about it and I said production values you know what what's going on here what what are we going to do and of course it's yet to be decided but you know there's some of the stuff talk of flamethrowers and just to give you an idea Captain found a base that he thinks he's probably going to use and he said uh, yeah I can use one of them that'd be good Get me five. <laughs> <laughs> We're saved on the tuning machine. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I think you know it's going to be quite good fun because you're going to see a bunch of old pensioners smashing up a load of gear. Every <laughs> <laughs> That's what you should call the tour. <laughs> Can we still destroy a drum kit properly? Can we? Is it <laughs> that, that's that's worth double the ticket price. <laughs> Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, do you know how much those drunkards cost? <laughs>